Welcome everyone, straight from the Scientist podcast. We are on UNC campus right now, um, hiding out in one of the li many libraries that dot the UNC campus. I'm here with Aaron David Nathan. He is a MD PhD student, right? Uh, Am I wrong about that? Again? <laughs> it's I'm a, sorry, you're a PhD student in right, pharmacy. Right. You have so many degrees that you have or have worked on in the past, I get confused. But he does have a PharmD. <laughs> um, so he will come out with two degrees at the end of all of this. Uh, and I'm really excited to talk, talk to him about his research, which is the field of HIV therapies and also his recent clinical rotations where he did go to the hospitals. Um, so a little bit of the MD PhD lifestyle, perhaps. <laughs> but if you want to learn a little bit more about Aaron, he's actually been on the podcast before. This is his second appearance. The first time was episode 24. We discussed uh, his research in kind of a broad context and also the differences between uh, course load in a school of pharmacy versus uh, his PharmD program. I want to find a little bit more about that and check that episode. Um, but we're going to really get into the science this time, the nitty gritty and the nuance of HIV research. Thanks for coming on, Aaron. No, thanks for having me again. So I was really fascinated by, I guess, one thing we did miss, actually, <laughs> episode 24, yeah. which I was hoping to do. And I, I, I put a little text intro in, um, just give people your perspective of HIV in, like from the base level, a so human immunodeficiency virus, right? Like, what right. does that mean? Do you like an expert? Yeah. So much like any other sort of immune diseases, this is a virus that infects your immune cells. So at the end of the day, the highlight really is the immunodeficiency part of HIV, which is individuals who are infected with HIV. Uh, let's say they don't get treated at all. Their immune systems are going to begin to fail and uh, they're going to be compromised. They won't be able to mount the appropriate immune response against, you know, very uh, everyday things that you and I would encounter, in which case our immune systems are fine. But for these individuals, our immune systems are are, are poor uh, because of this. Now, granted, treatment is there, uh, which is nice to help preserve the immune system. Uh, but just in general, uh, individuals like these are unable to mount that immune response. And so those uh, we kind of just say in general that they're immune, immunodeficient, immunocompromised, those types of words. So that's what it means to me is just individuals who, are, uh, for lack of a better term, they're just sick. Mm -hmm. uh, and fortunately, there's treatment out there to help treat it. Not cure it yet, but treat it. <laughs> but it's doing a lot of, of good work. It's extending lifespans, if not basically saving people's lives yeah. altogether, right? Right. So one thing I've always been a little confused about is why there are kind of two terms for HIV. There's HIV, and then they say it's the virus that causes AIDS, which right. auto immune deficiency syndrome right um are there any viruses that also cause aids that aren't hiv no it's just okay. uh it's just hiv so it's the okay. uh, well there's two types of hiv there's hiv1 which is oh. what we usually which is what we see here mm -hmm. in the united states and western european countries and hiv2 which you also i guess technically see here but it's just not as common okay so yes aids is kind of a catch-all term for infections that occur when your immune system is really bad uh -huh. Uh, it really can't fight off anything. So it's just sort of a uh, an umbrella term. Uh, but HIV, because of, you know, it uh, it uh, getting to your immune system and, and uh, infecting and so forth and compromising its ability, that puts you more prone to infections. And then that's is that is AIDS. OK, so I, I know in uh, Alzheimer's disease, which is my field of research, um, late stage patients often die from like pneumonia rather than their like paralysis or anything like that. Right. Um, so it's not necessarily the brain that's collapsing first uh, when these patients die. It's it's actually their immune system, mm -hmm. which is a common thread throughout the progression of Alzheimer's disease. Um, but they, they often die of pneumonia or they die of anything else. So I wonder if that's I don't think it would necessarily be classified as AIDS, but it seems like a kind of a similar phenomenon. Um, and we really don't understand like why the immune system is failing in these patients. Mm, Just kind of, yeah, I was wondering if AIDS could be a catch-all for any other viruses or conditions, but I guess it is. It's only associated with HIV if we see it in the literature anyway, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Cool. So there's two types of HIV. Didn't yeah. I really know that. Are there <laughs> any like major differences other than where they're found or like when did they split off as well? 
Yeah, that's a good question. I don't honestly know too much about HIV-2, uh, just because we just don't really see that very often here. Uh, but there are uh, resources to help delineate the two. Off the top of my head, other than geographic prevalence, uh, there is small mutation patterns that can differ between the two uh, that uh, may pretend the use, I guess, of antiretrovirals. I honestly don't know off the top of my head. I haven't really looked into it, but that is a good question because there is slight differences uh, and there are guidelines that are put out there by the WHO, by the United States Department of Health and Human Services that do address the HIV-2. But HIV-1 is the one that we mostly think about when it comes to, quote, HIV infections. Okay. Good to know. And so there might be different guidelines, but yeah, we can maybe post a couple links um, that you think are general good resources for as well. So. Um, yeah, this, that's fascinating, actually. So in you're in Dr. Angela Kushuba's lab. That's right, right yeah. Right? And um, you're really honing in on HIV-1 there, so mm-hmm. not so much HIV-2. Right. Now, last time you told me about how you were trying to like track down HIV because it hides in various parts of the body. Right. Maybe we're good at clearing it out of the bloodstream, but it's the other organs that are the problem. Exactly. If like one HIV particle stays in, one viral particle stays in there, it can then come back essentially kind of like cancer um, remission and then and resurgence mm-hmm. kind of similar yeah I say I say it's pretty similar so yeah I'd mentioned before we can take care of HIV in the blood uh, so this is I think I even use this exact uh, analogy before which is like if you ask me to water your lawn I can water it but then you tell me I want you to make sure that every blade of grass is watered in which case I can uh, I don't know how to I don't know how to verify that <laughs> without <laughs> and, drowning the rest of the lawn. Yeah. Exactly, and so similar to oncology uh, areas, HIV has become a little bit more targeted. Uh, so you mentioned before, individuals can live with HIV for quite a bit of time, uh, almost as long, if not as long as say you or me. Uh, but yeah, so curing HIV is always difficult because there's always one part of the body where it can still hide, still technically just be latent, as we call just sort of sleeping there and then waiting to arise when something happens. Uh, so yeah, our lab is looking, one of the projects that our lab is doing is looking at areas in the body in which HIV does reside and remain latent. So these are obviously very huge immunological organs. Lymph node is a big one. Spleen is a big one. Gut associated lymphoid tissue or a pr- nicely named GALT uh, is a big one. And then of course the brain is a big one. These are places that have a lot of immune cells. And then uh, geographically speaking, uh, testes, vagina, ovary, cervix, these are just really important, not only from an immunological standpoint, but also from a transmission standpoint. Mm-hmm. So what we do is we characterize the amount of antiretrovirals, which are drugs that are used to treat HIV <clears throat> in these tissues. And then our goal is to, once we do all that, to then collate the information, see if we see any trends among brain different brain areas for instance different lymph nodes different parts of the reproductive tract and of course the spleen uh, which is what i'm looking at uh and see if there's any differences and then look at reasons why there would be differences in in distribution of antiretrovirals so the big one that we're looking at is are there any differences in drug transporters drug transporters are huge uh and we can get into that as well because i think that's important uh, to be able to look at what are the transporters that may influence the distribution of these drugs into these areas. Mm-hmm. The drug transporters, um, we're typically thinking of into cell or yeah, into cell transporting. So transporting across the cell membrane, mm-hmm. say you're in the bloodstream, in the capillaries, and then you have to get into the actual cell that's infected, right? Right. So, so the cell membrane, for those who aren't necessarily attuned, is this like fatty lipid, it's a, called a lipid bilayer because it's double fat wall, and it keeps most things out that won't dissolve in fats themselves. But anything that dissolves readily in water might actually have a tough time getting over passively, like by itself. Um, so we need active transport, right? It's these right. proteins that grab it and they chuck it over the wall and then it gets in the cell. Um, so what, what do you look for when, uh, what do you look for when you're looking at these transporters? Are, do you use like antibodies to track them down or, um, and then I guess a, a later question might be, are, are you thinking about inserting transporters in places where it seems really hard to get drugs to? Um, or maybe pairing with nanotechnology people. <laughs> this is yeah, a series of questions. You don't have to no, get them out before I forget. Those are great. <laughs> yeah, those are great questions. So it's threefold. So the first one is seeing what are the transporters that are there. So we know, for instance, that the gut 
has a ton of transporters. That's where a ton of drugs are being absorbed uh, in the duodenum of the small intestine. That's just what happens if we know some of the transporters that are, that are there. So there's P glycoprotein, which is a huge one. Uh, so actually, before I get into that, drug transporters are divided into two. There's uptake transporters, and then there's efflux transporters. Efflux, as you can imagine, is pumping the drug out, and uptake is to take them up. So for instance, the brain we know has PGP, which is a protective mechanism to pump out drugs. And again, drugs are simply just exogenous chemicals that aren't technically speaking supposed to be in our body. Like for instance, we don't naturally make antiretrovirals, though that would be pretty cool, but we don't. <laughs> yeah, <that's an> idea. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, these are just chemicals. And so it gets absorbed and then we want it to go to the brain, but the brain says, no, this is supposed to be a very sterile area. I don't want it. And then we'll pump it out using, for instance, PGP. Mm -hmm. And so we have a number of efflux and uh, uptake transporters that we know are related to antiretrovirals, that we know antiretrovirals use as, uh, as the transport. Mm -hmm. And so we hone in on those nine in particular, uh, and then we characterize them by three ways. One is to look at it via gene expression, to look at if there's RNA that's being expressed within the tissues themselves. Mm -hmm. Two is to actually quantify them using a process called Quantitative Targeted Absolute Proteomics, or QTAP for short. Uh, this actually gives us the ability to look at specific peptides, which are, again are these transporter proteins, and then actually quantify them on a, uh, on a picomole to milligram scale. Uh, and the third way is to actually look at them via immunohistochemical stra staining. Mm -hmm. So I see staining is going to help us to be able to, like you had mentioned with your first question, which is the antibodies to these proteins. Now can we actually see where they're being localized within slices of tissue? Uh, so that's been pretty cool. So what I've done thus far is the gene aspect, looking at the RNA to see if any of that's being transcribed in the tissues, and then also the quanti quantification of the protein. And step three is going to be that IHC. So I'm on my way to working on that. Figuring out where it is in like the brain, for example. So um, you mentioned all these issues and organs. Are you you're looking at all of them? You're looking at all I'm of personally looking at the spleen. Our okay, lab is right looking here. at all of them all together, but I'm personally looking at the spleen. Okay. So you do a lot of this work in mice? Yeah. Or? So we have three, actually hot off the press, now we have three different tissues. Mice mm -hmm. was a big one. Macaque, rhesus macaque is a big one. Uh, and rhesus macaque is one that is used a lot for HIV AIDS research. The immune systems of macaques are very similar to that of humans. And of course, the last one is human tissue. Mm -hmm. And so human tissue is always a dicey one right. because no one's just going to willingly give their spleen, uh, unfortunately. Lymph node is doable now. You can, do, you can actually do a biopsy of the lymph node. Oh, wow. uh, and you can even make it very fairly non-invasive called a fine needle aspirate or FNA mm -hmm. of the lymph node as well. So... You don't have to go under anesthesia to, to do all that, which is nice. Where do they take that out of? Um, is they, it a particular area? Like, I know I can sometimes feel them in my neck or like yeah. you know, my leg somewhere. So, yeah, so the leg is a big one. The okay. femoral uh, area, the inguinal lymph node, uh, is underneath our armpit there. Uh, so it, it doesn't have to be, you know, like you have to go through your neck or anything mm -hmm. like that. Spleen is a little bit more difficult to get, and you're not going to get that un unless a patient dies. And so all of our spleen, hum human spleen tissues have come from post-mortem patients. Uh, so just kind of a bank that they have for HIV AIDS research. And then we ask them, do you have spleen? And they say yes or no. And then if they do, then they come into us and then we can analyze them. Mm -hmm. So mice, and we have two different strains of mice. And then macaque and then human. Okay. So you have two strains of mice. My, I know mice are great um, model organisms because you can knock out genes or you right. can knock in genes so you can change perhaps the immune response of the mice in a way that you can't do in, in humans and would take much, much longer to do in, in monkeys, macaques. Um, are, are those the two strains of mice? Do you have maybe one that's vulnerable or I don't want to put words in your mouth? Yeah, no, these are, these are both mice that have been genetically engineered to have an immune system similar to humans. Oh. You can only model it uh, enough. Humanized uh, immune. Humanized mice. Yeah, that's what we call them. So humanized mice. So they have, ha they're uh, BLT mice. Uh, so these are bone marrow liver thymus. So these are specific mice that have been, uh, Born a mice, born a mouse, but are trained to be human, <laughs> and so uh, they uh, essentially are supposed to mount uh, immune response similarly to humans. Now, of course, you can only get so far with that because they are mice. Right. Uh, but the idea is that 
uh, they're human enough right. that maybe we can be able to ha- make some dedu- deductions from that. Do you know much about the like base differences between a mouse and a human immune system? I can only imagine that mice are exposed to a lot more nasty stuff, like, yeah. <laughs> running along the ground, <laughs> digging through trash and whatnot in the wild. Yeah, so certainly some of the organisms that they encounter are probably going to be different, uh, but their ability to mount an immune system uh, is going to be different than that of human from the standpoint of their machinery is a little bit different, hmm. is from my understanding of it. So it's it it, it can't be as fast. Uh, their lifespans are a little bit are obviously much less. They're not on uh, you know decades that you know you and I can go. Uh, so they're a little bit more prone to uh, not having as robust of an, Im- an immune system. So it's kind of like putting a uh, uh, square peg in a round hole, I guess, if you were to try to uh, mix the two. So they actually have a weaker immune system. I, I would think it would have been the opposite. But I would say if you try to compare them on like the same scale, mm-hmm. it's I mean, there's no there's no competition like we can you and I could be able to withstand a whole host of different uh, different things and we can live for quite a bit of time. That's true. Uh, whereas mice, of course, cannot uh, for a whole host of reasons, maybe not just the immune system, mm-hmm. uh, but their immune system is different. Okay. I guess is probably the only way that I know how to describe it. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe it's like the hair and the tortoise first hair that burns out faster. I don't know. I- I, I don't. I, this is pure conjecture on my part. <laughs> yeah, no. I, I, so I, I honestly don't know too much about it, but I okay. think uh, because they age faster, mm-hmm. at least their definition of old in quotes is going to be different than right. us. It's like and so, two and a half, three years for a mouse. Right. right. And so <laughs> we know for mammals that as you get older, your immune system gets weaker. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Uh, so I would think as a mice gets older, its immune system will also get weaker, as it should be. Right. Uh, and it can't mount that uh, immune response as well, and there's that. So in these humanized mice, you're actually adding immune capabilities, making them yeah. better at it? Okay. And then I'm guessing you make it worse by adding HIV. To <laughs> yeah, so then we, we then infect them with HIV. Mm-hmm. Is there a specific strain, like a modified strain that infects mice, or is this... Um, you have to add like human immune cells in first and then you can add HIV because it, it is human immunodeficiency virus, not right. mouse, right? Or are you using MIV? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. So there is no MIV. So it's just, uh, it only infects two mammals naturally, humans and various number of uh, monkeys. Okay. Rhesus macaque, uh, African green monkeys, there's a whole host of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, so for instance, the macaques, there's a, a specific HIV like thing for macaque, which is called simian, which is just a broad term for monkeys, simian human immunodeficiency virus or shiv. Uh, so that's great for macaques. Humans, HIV. Mice, since these are humanized mice, it's also HIV. Okay. So I can, yeah, that's the system that works. That right. Makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Um, so what is, um, an average day look like for you i know today we're pretty close to one of your classroom buildings right right um, you have classes running throughout the summer or? no not during the summer uh so the summer is really focused on doing the lab work so this mm-hmm. particular summer i spent a lot of time quantifying the transporter proteins of mice and macaques and then okay. now having just received the human tissue i just completed that process yesterday so it's good timing yeah <laughs> <laughs> and then i've also Exactly. And I've also worked on uh, preparing slides for IHC, uh, specifically in macaques, just because that's what we have left. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then uh, seeing that. So, no, we don't have classes during the summer. Classes are going to be starting up pretty soon. Yep. And uh, it's going to be fun. So the first year in particular was a pretty tough year, mm-hmm. at least in our program, as it always is. Uh, just just kind of get your feet wet in the research lab and your focus is really on classes to try to get that up and running but then once the summer comes around it's hitting the ground running with with the research and then having that continue on in the second year Mm -hmm. so you're in your second year um i I know for me about two years of classes maybe a little more uh like i'm a rising third year i Mm -hmm. actually won't have any classes this semester one next semester and then probably be done unless i want to keep taking more which i just might Um, same for you or do you have classes through like a full tenure of (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it is exactly like you said. So it's two years of classes that are mandated. Anything after that's going to be based on if your committee wants you to take a certain class or anything like that. If they feel like you need to learn a little bit more about, for instance, for me, virology would be a big one. Mm-hmm. That's going to be a huge one for me to take if I can. Um, 
or uh, a number of students TA. They sure. have classes there uh, because I have a PharmD. I'm able to kind of bridge into the PharmD curriculum as well if they feel that you know they could use some help there mm -hmm. for TAing that one or uh, infectious diseases type of modules or HIV modules is of course what I would personally request. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, so there's, there's opportunities I think within yeah. our program to be able to to do all that. Very cool, very cool. So are you you thinking about TAing then? Uh, is that kind of a allude to you want to be a professor um, after graduating or yeah. what's the path look like? At the <laughs> That's a wonderful question. You know, you're not the first person, of course, to ask me that. And <laughs> it's interesting you mentioned that because I was just talking to my parents uh, two days ago and they were asking me that. What am of I going to do? Of course they're going to ask. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> so I always saw myself in academia. Mm. But as I learned more about some of the routes that scientists can go into, uh, there's a lot of different ways that they can get in, that they can get involved. And I would say my dream, actually, as I look at it now, would be to work at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, mm. nonprofit, and they work naturally with HIV AIDS is a huge one that they work into. Right. And so I feel like I could potentially lend some expertise in that area uh, and then maybe, you know, be of some asset to to that company. And I think that would be pretty sweet to work in. The, and if you ever look at their website, their mission and values are just totally in line with what I feel mm -hmm. you know, helping others aiding others uh, in need and that's just I mean that's just how I operate and I feel like that would just be a mutual beneficially uh, endeavor right there with you yeah I actually um, was talking to another podcaster I'm not sure if this is going to make it in the final cut of what we were discussing but he asked me there are like three people that you could choose to like have them live forever they can't be family or friends or loved ones um, who would they be? And one of them was uh, Bill Gates because yeah. of the amazing. I mean, he's just like eliminating so many diseases, or at least in the process of eliminating so many diseases that uh, have threatened the human race in the past, and and could if they ever resurge in the future. Right. Exactly. Yeah, that's a great uh, goal to aspire to. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe this will help uh, you get in touch with him. Oh, that'd be great. The foundation itself. <laughs> Very cool. So do you have to do a postdoc after um, uh, graduating with a PhD in pharmacy tech, like traditionally? Because I know like a traditional PhD in my side of the biomedical sciences, that's thought of as the normal track. Now it's yeah. getting less and less common. these. Days, right? mm -hmm. Yeah, so it depends on the route you want to go. If you want to go in academia, definitely 100 yeah. percent, you got to do a postdoc. <laughs> if you want to do industry, for instance, is a postdoc necessary? I guess the official answer is it couldn't hurt. <laughs> well, you lose some years. To Other than that, yeah, so it only hurts you, I guess. But I guess the experience cost. gain, yeah, so the opportunity cost. And so for a lot of industry jobs, from my understanding, is that they don't necessarily require a postdoc. But they do require, or at least would love for you to have, is having that experience beforehand. So a lot of individuals in our program if they want to go that route, we'll do an internship during the summer, for instance. And it's usually based around uh, third year, the, the years between third and fourth year. So after your second year, you do your qualifying exam. So you're kind of uh, focusing on that. And then your third year, you know, you, ha you don't have the classes, but now you're focusing strictly on your dissertation. And between the third and fourth years, super ideal to do uh, that internship if your committee allows. And the committees allow because they understand that they know. I mean, as long as you're not getting super far behind, or you're just not doing anything, <laughs> uh, which is, of course, definitely a no-no. But uh, yeah, so internships are a big one. So pharmaceutical companies love having mm -hmm. individuals in pharmaceutical sciences yeah. to come in, do an internship for 12 weeks or something like that during the summer, May through June, July, what have you. Uh, you just get the experience. And honestly, for the most part, a lot of that does lead to entry-level jobs after graduation. It's usually kind of a you know unspoken rule where it's like, you know, we... You know, if it was like Aaron, we like the work that you did these past three months. Keep us in mind when you know when you're getting close to defending your dissertation. Mm -hmm. I say, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah that, you're. I will. That fortune. As long as you like working there, yeah, yeah. you get to test it out too. Yeah, exactly, big. and it gives you the experience. You think, okay, this is what it's going to be like if I were to work here. Mm -hmm. Culture, you know, type of work, all that stuff. Supervisor, but yeah. exactly. Are you considering any of those internships? Or I am, yeah. So when it comes down to that, so fortunately I'm only a second year. Uh, and uh, so when it gets down to that point, then I'll start looking at what are some of the opportunities there and you know what are some of the upperclassmen, what they have done, and what are my friends, what have they done, and course location. 
got to be uh got to take a look at that cuz winter comes around in New Jersey pretty uh <laughs> pretty wickedly so I'll take that into account too. <laughs> fair. That's very fair. So um do you you go home and winter breaks and stuff like that for a while and you would have time to do internships then? Yeah, if I I think um Fortunately, they're very fluid, which is nice just based on company needs and all that type of stuff. So it is very fluid. And mm-hmm. that's the beauty of it doing it in your third year, for instance, is that it's also very fluid in your lab because sure. you don't have to worry about, oh, I'm going to miss class or final exams or anything like that. So there have been some people who've done internships in a quote unquote off time, which is spring semester, for instance. So like kind of a January to March type of time or an October to December or like September to November, that type of thing. Uh, so it's definitely doable. It's just you know all about communicating and availability on both ends. You go through Tibbs um, or much. I know Tibbs has their own internship program. Yeah. So a number of individuals I know have looked through Tibbs for internship opportunities. A lot of the stuff I'm talking about has been either through Tibbs, which I don't know the prevalence of that, but also just been word of mouth. Mm-hmm. Okay. So word of mouth is huge. Yeah. Being like, oh, hey, I just did an internship. They're looking at someone, you know, maybe an upperclassman comes in after June, July, and they say, hey, they're looking for someone to start in September. It's something you might want to think about. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, well, yeah, yeah one month. Works, yeah. yeah, why not? Just that quickly. <laughs> uh, or just something like that. So word of mouth is a big one. So we've had graduate students go to all different types of uh, GlaxoSmithKline, AbbVie, Vive here in RTP, mm-hmm. uh, and all that stuff. So big companies, too. Yeah, there are a lot of great um, resources here just in the Triangle, which mm-hmm. is pretty unique. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like a southern Boston, Boston area, if I <laughs> <laughs> describe it to some people. It's smaller, sure, than the Boston-Cambridge um, setup they have up there, but it's growing, ever-growing. Yeah, no, RTP is very big on uh, on that. And I think they like, I mean, they like the students that they have around here, NC State, Duke, UNC. And so when we you know, apply there, they, they know the sort of the rigor that we go through. And so that's certainly works in our favor. Being a rigor, any um, really tricky classes, <laughs> any, anything you're concerned about? Now you got quals coming up. Uh, I guess it would be spring of 2019. Right. Or, okay. Yeah. I just got through mine. So wish you luck. It's, it's not as bad as you think it is, but it's good to be a little concerned about it because then you over prepare and that's better than right. the officer. So fortunately, the way that we do it here is it's not a sit down exam. Okay. So you don't have to go somewhere and just sit down for like eight hours and, mm-hmm. you know, wake up and it's like August. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, it's a, this is a take home week long thing oh, endeavor. Nice. So they just give you a number of questions and they say, you know, we'll see you on Friday mm. and you come in, turn it in and, you know, they take some time to grade it and then you pray, <laughs> I guess, or you have to remediate some aspects and they work with you there. Uh, so classes wise, uh, since they front loaded us a lot during uh, the first year, a lot of classes are offered every other year. And so that just happened to be the year that they offered it in every other year. This particular year, they have a couple classes that we have. Pharmacogenomics is a big one, which is huge. Uh, but then the first year, we did a lot of pharmacometrics work. Uh, so this is pharma, pharmacology modeling, utilizing computer software to be able to mimic the human body. Uh, and so it's fascinating. Yeah, it's 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 huge. The FDA even is one of those individuals that have actually looked at it and said we we accept it as actual science to be able to help predict exposure of various drugs in humans, which is pretty awesome. Yeah, we did uh, an overview of it in one of my classes, but we never really got into like how it worked. And I was just like, hey, do we just trust this? Why? Like, what's the proof behind that? So no, it's good to know that the FDA is backing it. Yeah, exactly. And so you know, people have submitted pharmaceutical modeling type of information mm-hmm. uh, to the FDA as part of their IND, as part of their NDA, and uh, it's accepted to get drug approval. Wow, and it's very statistics heavy, and so there's a huge learning curve. And so when we learned it, you not only have to learn, you know, the processes behind pharmacology uh, and not only, you know, the ability to utilize the software that they use for this type of work, but then you also have to understand the statistics behind it mm-hmm. and all that stuff. And so it's a, uh, we had that last year, there was a whole year of that and different modules focusing on different, you know, aspects of the modeling uh, mm-hmm. process, but it was a, uh, that was tricky. <laughs> it's pretty busy. And, you know, it's a lot of trial and error. And mm-hmm. so many nights were spent 
<laughs> working on it. winning weekends of course <laughs> going through that but it was a it was a good learning experience and it was pretty fun at the end of the day you find it useful in your current research i imagine or oh yeah this is a, was huge yeah. yeah trying to uh marry the two fields of hiv and modeling which honestly hasn't really been done that much uh and that's even the thing with modeling it's all about what question you want to you want to ask uh so it's totally different types of modeling different types of reasons to model different types of questions to answer and ask and so i think modeling is one of the ways to uh to take you there mm -hmm. yeah so walk us through like a day in the life <laughs> i know i asked this question a little earlier yeah and we got on the classes which sure important I, I think a lot of people want to hear about that but i think a lot of people now want to have asked me like want to know what it's really like like living your life in the oh. lab and in the class. Um, so I I know we work in the same building technically. Yeah, right. on the fourth floor. You're on the first floor. I walked by uh, the Kashuba lab the other day. I was looking for you <laughs> in there. But then you're also about uh, one and a half, two city blocks away in school of pharmacy with right. classes, seminars, uh, and stuff. I assume exactly. Um, so like, what's a typical day like? How many times are you changing buildings? And um, yeah, yeah. So. Typical day is always such a difficult answer because it's yeah. like, you know, we're actually riding the bridge of school to summer. So let me go more of a uh, typical week. Maybe it's fine. Typical yeah. week. Yeah. Let me go. go let me go on a week scale. So I usually come in. Uh, I don't know how detailed you want me to get into, but I usually come in around like 730, 745. Try to come in before eight uh, just to try to beat the traffic That's uh, fair. for like anything. <laughs> no, because I love the mornings or anything. Uh, but yeah, come in. And depending on what I need to do that particular week. So this past week, I did a lot of uh, protein quantification. So that requires uh, you to, you know, of course, cut the tissues, mm -hmm. cut the physical tissues, and then uh, go through the extraction pro extraction of the protein that's within the tissue. And then, of course, then do the process of solid phase extraction and all that to prep it for uh, one of our collaborators to actually analyze it for the protein concentration. Solid phase extraction. Yeah. So, oh. that a little bit. <laughs> so uh, this is a, actually an analytical chemistry method, but mm -hmm. the idea is to help purify some of the contents that you were trying to trying to attain. Okay. Uh, so solid phase extraction has been utilized for decades in the context of chemical compounds. So it's really just a, a way to be able to isolate a compound in the chemistry field. Uh, and then be able to uh, isolate that and then purify it. And so that's really what it does. In this case, we're just using it to isolate and purify proteins. The transporters? The transporter better? proteins okay. in particular, or just any proteins. And then we'll label them with, uh, and then we, before we give it, we'll label them with a radio labeled uh, uh, transporter uh, peptide mm -hmm. uh, so that the machine that they use with their machines that I don't really know too much about. <laughs> Their analytical machines will then be able to detect and then we get a response and then mm -hmm. that response turns into a concentration and that's the number we work with. Right. Uh, so this past week I've been I've been doing that. So we had, like I mentioned, human spleens come in. I went ahead and cut them, uh, which doesn't take too long to do. And there was seven of them, I believe. And then you do the protein extraction and protein extraction requires you to really make sure that you get it purified. So you had to go have to put it through an ultra centrifuge. And we have a collaborator here at the School of Pharmacy. So it requires me to have to take uh, some samples over there and the ultra centrifuge them and then take them back to GMB. Uh, so this particular week was pretty hot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, that was uh, so that was that. And then this QTAP process is a two day affair. Mm -hmm. So the first day is preparing it for the trypsin digestion. So the trypsin digestion is where you put in the radio labeled peptides and then it will then kind of eat it up. Uh, and that takes anyone. Yeah. yeah. And breaks it down uh, so that it can be revealed when it gets to that point or and then you can purify it and then reveal it in the machine later on. So it's a radioactive tag. Um, right. And then you can use what is it? Uh, X-ray film. Uh, to detect it or how are you detecting that radioactive tag yeah it's done through a um, it's done through a mass spec okay uh, tandem another mass magic spec machine <laughs> another magic machine <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's a two day affair uh, most of it's just uh, you had put into kind of a rocker and let the trips and do its work uh, that's about 16 hours for it to do that so you just kind of put it in a machine you just come back the next day right. and then it's good to go and so we do that uh yeah so it's like 16 to 20 hours somewhere around there uh and then you 
and then you do the solid phase extraction as I mentioned before and then and then take it over and then we take it over to our collaborator here at, at the school of pharmacy another hot day it was yesterday yep. <laughs> and then i think it was like 92 and hot and humid and of course Always. i have of course yeah. i go in the middle of the day when yeah. it's the hottest uh and then uh, we give it to him and then he'll analyze it and then report back to us with the results so that's what it was this week and mm -hmm. Uh, this past summer, I did that a lot for all right. these macaque tissues, which we had 18 macaque tissues and uh, 42 mice. So it, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it took a number of weeks uh, to imagine. do that. <laughs> so that's what I've been doing this past summer. So and then we've I've gotten a number of results back, which is great. And then, you know, hopefully put that all together into uh, talking about it in the literature. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> When's the when should we watch for a publication coming? I'm going to go pending. <laughs> I don't want to tie myself to a date there. That's fine. Yeah, I, I would be the same. Yeah. <laughs> Some people have timetables and they always get delayed anyway. So yeah. So <laughs> I know it's just like, I want to do it by the end of the semester. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, class is getting the way yeah. and all that stuff. So I'll go by the time I graduate. <laughs> <laughs> Is that uh, generally in um, in your department? It's like one paper for graduation or? Yep, got to have a first author publication that's related to your dissertation. Mm -hmm. So this will all fall in line with that. Absolutely. Uh, but it's uh, got to have it before you go. Yep. They want to say, they want to see, I, I can't recall if it's, you have to submit it or if it has to actually be accepted. Mm. Uh, but of course, you know, as a graduate student, you want to get that work out there. Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> so at least my internal like threshold, it has to be accepted somewhere. Right. So that you can actually show it to whoever's interviewing you at exactly. the same position and say, yes, this is proof that I did that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, we haven't really talked about it so much on the podcast, but getting a PhD and earning it requires that you actually do push whatever field you're working in forward. Yeah. Push the understanding of HIV therapy, for example, forward um, to, to add to the base of knowledge that the human race has accrued. And right. a lot of people don't necessarily think about it in that way. They just, oh, I got to publish, like I got to check these boxes. But yeah. really all you're trying to do is um, discover something new right. as a student, which is always a little unnerving, I think. Because <laughs> as a student, you're kind of used to, okay, this is what we know, and now I memorize it, and then I regurgitate it. And then a PhD track is completely different in that. Um, not only you're you're applying that stuff to do something that no one else has done before, and they... Yeah, they let students do it, but at the same time, we've been trained uh, and we, we have people watching over our shoulder. Um, yeah, and it's it, a lot of, uh, and you're right, and it's a lot of, uh, you of course do the work, but you you were the one that pushes the boundary. So if you said, mm -hmm. so if I said, you know what, if if my department didn't say you gotta require it and if I didn't feel like it, I'd say, I don't need to publish, forget it. Like, what do I need to do? If I had that mentality. Yeah. Uh, in that case, then it's like, what what are you really doing, I guess? Right. Yeah, why are you here? <laughs> <laughs> but the onus is really on you, as I'm sure you know, to like push things forward. Right. Uh, so, you know, just like with, uh, you know, just like in life, I guess you, whatever you put into it is what you'll get out of it. And so, at least for me, I'd like to try to be on top of things and try to do all that. And it's, uh, and it's fun because, I don't know, I really like reading. Mm -hmm. And so I read a lot of the literature pretty much on a daily basis. Try to go home and try to read something. I like to put the emphasis on the word try. <laughs> it doesn't always happen. Right? <laughs> it doesn't always happen. You understand that as well. Yeah. So I have to go home and I think, okay, it's, you know, 7 p.m. or something. Got to mm -hmm. eat something. All right, let me eat. You think, oh, well, yeah, computer's open. Let me, uh, I'll, I'll just watch, you know, an episode of this while I'm eating. Kill two birds with one stone. It's like, oh, one episode leads to another. Yep. Ah, okay. Got to figure out what happens at the end of this one. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, so the onus is on you. So the mm -hmm. burden falls on you to be able to, you know, get as much as you want out of the PhD program as you do. So yeah, you can just check the boxes and you know call it a day. But if you said, you know, I really want to explore this really deeply, just for like my own curiosity then you are, if you're in an ability to do that, you're in an institution like UNC, for instance, that gives you the ability to do that, to learn more, take classes, learn the information, work with your PI that knows a heck of a lot more than you do, uh, and to talk with him or her about it and all that stuff. So and it's other always- people around campus, yeah. And other people around campus, and like, this is your opportunity to do that. And yeah, it takes a while, but to learn, and to like truly be an expert on something when you graduate, you don't want to be at the point where it's just like, oh, I don't know how to do this, which is fine as long as you learn how to do it. 
But it's like, I don't know how to learn how to do it. Right. It's like, uh, that's kind of a problem because that's like the basis of life. Yeah. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> that's, supposed to have that maybe going into the PhD <laughs> to some degree, but then yeah. definitely have it mastered uh, at the end of it. So yeah, self-motivation is a huge asset, I think, in these studies because it is so flexible and it's self-driven. And I mean, I, I value the independence and the freedom that I have to operate Within the bounds of reason, of course, right. <laughs> <Just> doing <laughs> random mad scientist experiments, but it does give you a chance to be creative as well in your hypotheses and how you might test them, especially if you have like a few extra samples right. or something to work with. Now, uh, motivation has been really key for me in that I'll go through these reading spurts where I'll read like you know eight papers in one day, and then I might not read any papers the next <laughs> day. But when I really uncover a bunch of literature in an area that interests me, I'm I'm engrossed in it and I can't pull myself away. Yeah, um, I hear you. How did you find the field of HIV therapy, in, uh, your field of interests, and like what drew you to that? Yeah, so this spawn this stems all the way back from to ninth grade. Huh. I had a ninth grade honors of biology class. I'll never forget. It was the first period of the day uh, in, in biology, honors of biology, and we learned about HIV in a very small general sense. Sure. Uh, and then ever since then, really, it was just I was just so fascinated by the immune system and like how it works. And as I started to learn more and more about it, and this was in two thousand and six or 2007 or so, whatever the semester was that I learned it. Uh, so this is about 11 years ago now. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, of course, know a lot more about the immune system. And it was just the immune system, when it works perfectly well, it works in tandem. Mm -hmm. And it works in a very regulated fashion. Things have to have these checkpoints and you got to make sure you hit this threshold and all that stuff. And at the end, at the end of the day, you then have memory. So if you ever see it again, you know what the body knows what to do. Mm -hmm. It learns just like how we learn. You know, if we if we say, "All right, so I need to look both ways before crossing the street," that's probably. And if I almost get hit by a car knocking on wood here, uh, then I know next time I should probably look both ways before just blindly crossing the street. So then, you know, we adapt. Our immune system adapts, and it adapts, or it maladapts, really, in the context of HIV. So I learned that in ninth grade. It was reinforced in uh, 12th grade biology when I took it as well. Uh, and then when I was in pharmacy school, then I honed in on the therapies for HIV, which were completely different from when I learned it in 2007. <laughs> uh, and that was just maybe like eight years difference at that point. Yeah, it uh, can be a lot of time. Yeah, the, the, the 2000s was a big thing for HIV in particular, HIV therapies. Mm. The, well, 90s, well, I guess since we've learned about it. <laughs> Making progress. 90s, but. 2000s, even this uh, decade. Uh, and then we, and then I just really liked it. I love the immune system still. I loved it, how it worked, or I guess not worked as well in HIV context. And then when I was a pharmacy resident last year, or two years ago, or whatever year it is now, <laughs> uh, then, uh, then I spent some time in the infectious De diseases clinic here at UNC, mm -hmm. uh, cared for a lot of individuals with HIV. So then I also got like the real world aspect of it. Uh, and then I wanted to take it to, uh, to the lab. Yeah. Uh, and here we are now. Hard not to be motivated after seeing patients. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, and I, I certainly want to be heading to the neuroscience, <clears throat> excuse me, neuroscience hospitals myself, because uh, even though they're a couple blocks away from here, I haven't really yeah. made as many visits as I should. So. Um, I, I do want to talk about those clinical rotations. For yeah. Sure. But first, you mentioned um, that the immune system is maladapted in a case of HIV therapy. What exactly do you mean by that? Yeah. So the point of our immune system at the end of the day, if you were to encounter something like if you have a cold and of course, a cold virus is very variable. But let's say you get, a, you get a vaccine. The point of the vaccine is that if you ever see that particular strain of whatever the vaccine was, your immune system will be able to handle it at a much quicker pace the next time around. Because at the end of it, it I get too into the weeds here, but the B cells, the plasma B cells will make the antibodies and then memory B cells will kind of store that information so that if you see it again, it will just quickly make antibodies. Mm -hmm. So it takes some time to first go around, but then it learns to look left and right before crossing the street. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing it is with HIV, except the regulation of the immune system because of HIV gets altered in a whole host of ways. Mm -hmm. So HIV infects CD4 T cells. Now, when I use the word, use the term CD4 T cells, it there's a lot of them. CD4 is just simply a marker on CD4 cells. So it would be like if I said, uh, 
Connor, I want you to tell me, uh, I want you to point out anyone who's wearing a shirt here in the library. And, <laughs> yeah, well, the library's I empty here. <laughs> it might just be us. Okay. <laughs> uh, but if we went outside and said, like, Connor, point out everyone who's wearing a shirt and we're in the middle of Times Square, mm -hmm. your head might spin and be like, well, there's, uh, there's so many mm -hmm. because that's not very specific. CD4 is the same way. There's a lot of CD4 shirts that T-cells are wearing. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, uh, so within the subset of CD4 cells, there's the helper T cell, which is sort of the mice, which is sort of the mastermind, I guess, of the immune system, and it differentiates in a whole host of different cells. And if you look at that classic immune chart that we had to memorize in biology, that to this day I can't really ever remember. Sorry, because <laughs> you can always look it up. When <laughs> you can always look it up. It up. <laughs> uh, but when you go to the helper T cell. Mm -hmm. uh, it like branches off into a whole host of different T cells, which are also CD4. Uh, so T follicular regulatory cells, T follicular helper cells, T uh, helper cells, which is the one I mentioned, T, T regs as they mm -hmm. call them, T reg cells. And so these are regulatory mechanisms for the formation of antibodies and all that stuff. If that gets altered, which it does because HIV is infecting those cells as well, mm -hmm. Now we have a problem because then you can't regulate it as well. And so you might think, well, if you can't regulate, if you can't, if you're taking the foot off the, the brake for antibodies, you're golden. You're making a ton of antibodies against HIV. You can just call it a day. Here's a problem. The antibodies are not, are not as specific. So it's attacking mm -hmm. HIV. Great. But it's also attacking other things that it shouldn't attack, like your own tissues, right. which is bad. So this is a problem in rheumatoid arthritis, in uh, psoriasis, all that stuff. And then two, you have the opposite effect, which is now you might actually regulate it too much, in which case you don't make enough antibodies. So individuals have antibody titers, which is the amount of antibody in your blood. Uh, some individuals or a lot of individuals who are infected with HIV can't mount their immune response as well, or they mount too much of a nonspecific response. Mm. And so you have both ends of the spectrum, which is, of course, bad uh, in that regard. And so you're not only taking your foot off the brake, but you're also perhaps uh, putting on the brake even more. Right. And so putting it at a full stop. And so that's where it gets kind of dicey with the immune system getting maladjusted. So it seems to me that HIV is kind of knocking out the high command of the immune system in some sense. And so yeah. some of the production facilities might still be there, but they don't really know what they're doing. And so yeah. they're just chucking out all this stuff or they're just shutting down like, oh, we haven't had any new orders come in. Let's not do anything. That's, that's exactly it. So it's like if you were to, if you were to, I don't know, a manufacturing plant that just continues to make it regardless of whether orders are coming in. Mm -hmm. You're going to have a surplus and it's like, what are you going to do yeah. uh, with that? And then you just sort of chuck it away, I guess, maybe the extra. Uh, so same thing here. You're making all these antibodies. They're not specific. And then on top of that, HIV can mutate. And so it's like oh, the yeah. antibodies you made aren't may have been specific for one strain, but then it mutates. And it's like, now what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. it's like, what can the body do? It doesn't know. Or if it does know, it can't. You know, it's just you're at an arms race there and it just gets bad. I've heard some talk about an HIV vaccine. And, yeah. And um, I don't know exactly where we are in the progress of that. I haven't caught up, but it seems like a good idea in a sense. You just put in an HIV particle, the immune system can mount antibody response and then they'll have memory for that. Right. Now, if someone were to get infected with HIV, and they've already had this vaccine. Is that maybe the trouble with it, developing a vaccine for it? Is that it's going to knock out the exact <laughs> cells that would have given the order to make the antibody against it? Or <laughs> The trouble is the mutation okay. and the unspecificity of later on in your life HIV mm -hmm. virus that will occur there. Right. So we'd and have to make a vaccine that was like so you'd have all to these get, different types. Exactly. Yeah. So you'd have to perhaps, and we wouldn't even know how to do this, yeah. is to list out every single mutation that HIV can do. Mm -hmm. And then throw it into a vaccine. This is the same reason why we can't just, be, why we can't just cure influenza right. altogether. Why the can't flu. we just eradicate it? Because the, flu vac yeah. the flu vaccine, we have to get it every year, which by the way, you should get every year. Uh, and then uh, it's the same, it, 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 you wonder, it's just like, well, why can't you just put it in all of them? Well, there's too many because it mutates too quickly. And so there's so many different strains and all that stuff. So it's the same reason. Mm. And so you're right, the HIV vaccine has come a long way because now, because it's in tandem with what we know about the immune system. Right. So I think we probably need to learn a lot more before it can be truly implemented on a wide scale. Hmm. But promising nonetheless. Promising nonetheless, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so let's loop back to those clinical rotations. I keep mm -hmm. forgetting to ask you about that. I have wanted to ask you about that <laughs> since we, <laughs> yeah. we touched base um, after the first episode. 
So what was that like? Um, maybe walk me through an average day for that and then what you got out of it. Yeah. So for a little bit of background, the program that I have, the pharmaceutical sciences program, if you have a previous clinical degree, which you of course love, if you have a previous clinical degree like myself, you then have to spend one month or an equivalent, I guess, uh, in doing a clinical rotation that's ideally related to what you're doing. So HIV is, of course, what I'm doing. And I was paired, uh, and what I had done was I was on the infectious diseases consult team here at UNC. Uh, so this is, a, I don't know if you're familiar with that team, uh, but the idea is is that this is a, uh, it's in the hospital, so I have to try to wear this. So I had this rotation actually as a resident as well. Mm. Uh, so this is a, in the hospital, primary teams, of course, if you get admitted to the hospital, you're going to have a primary team who's taking care of you. But if there's some sort of infection that, you know, they're either unable to handle or they want a little bit more of a specialized expertise in it, then they'll co- make a formal consult to the infectious diseases service to have them take a look at the take a look at the patient. Oh, so you have like an extra team of experts coming in. Exactly. And so hospitals, especially general medicine services, love that. You know, mm-hmm. it just makes it easier for them. They're able to get, you know, expert opinions on management of the infections, for instance, and any sort of diagnostics that needs to occur. Mm-hmm. And so... I was part of that team. So this was a immune, ICID is what it's called. So the immune compromised infectious diseases team. So I was working with one of the pharmacists who, an infectious diseases pharmacist who was there, uh, who I had known. Uh, and then we, what we do is we're sort of kind of like the consult to the consult. And so we help with the judicious use of antibiotics and antimicrobials, I guess, in a more broad sense in immune compromised hosts which is sort of in line with HIV. So a lot of these patients have, you know, bone marrow or post bone marrow transplant or they've just or they have gone through rounds of chemo or or they've just had transplant of like a solid organ transplant like a kidney or liver or something like that. And so I spent a month doing that. And so I learned a lot of uh, management of various infections that you don't normally see in people like you and me, but you would see in people who had like say AIDS. And so like cryptococcal meningitis is a big one or is one. Uh, so that's meningitis is of course inflammation in the uh, in the meningeal, meningeal space in the brain. Uh, and cryptoc- like the plastic wrap that protects the brain in, right. in some sense. And cryptococcal means that it's based on the cryptococcus, which is a fungal, which is a fungus. Now, people like you and me, fungus, fungi don't really do anything because we're we're relatively healthy individuals. Uh, you look like you're more so than me, but the idea is you're deceiving. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the idea is is that uh, in immune compromised people, like I mentioned before, it can't amount an immune response. They get infected with a lot of these infections that. Are, are bad they're really serious infections and so uh i spent a month doing that and taking care of them and so the uh, you had asked about the day which uh, i forgot to mention uh it's <laughs> quite all right <laughs> uh so we so what i did was i pre-rounded on a lot of patients which means that i look at you know who are the who are the people we're being consulted on who are the patients we're being consulted on what are some of the primary issues that they have there and uh and then i start to look at the guidelines and some of the primary literature as to how to manage that and then help the team formulate a plan for that patient that they will give to the primary team to then implement in for that patient so yeah i've always wondered like there's so much new literature coming out Mm -hmm. all these different policy changes might be in effect in hospitals how does a physician even keep up when they're also supposed to be visiting patients all the time yeah you know classic idea of a doctor is they come in rushed and then they ask you three questions and they leave well that's because they have all this other stuff to do so it's great right. you, you're kind of taking a load off of their shoulders yeah saying hey here's um kind of a translated version of all these papers a broken down version here are some actionable everyone big buzzword <laughs> actionable <laughs> things to do for the patient that's really, i didn't realize that was happening that's yeah great that, that, that ha- that's a you know it's actually very interesting you mentioned that because it's a uh, you're absolutely right. People are incredibly busy. So physicians are, of course, very busy at the hospital, mm-hmm. especially if you look at primary team physicians, not necessarily consults, but just primary teams. They have to coordinate everything. Uh, so they have to, of course, you know, visit the patient, you know, come up with the plan. But then they have to coordinate any sort of new admissions that they have to take care of, any discharges. There's always a ton of paperwork that goes into there. Where is a patient going to get discharged? For you and me, it's probably pretty simple. We just go home. But what if, you know, you're older, you have maybe have to go to an assisted living facility, you have to coordinate that, make some communications, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. So it helps if there's someone on the team who can read the literature in a consistent way 
detailed basis and then transmit that information to the team. Also, so, having the background context can't be a bad thing. And of course, having the yeah. background context. You know if what you're reading is actually <laughs> going to be useful or not. Yeah. And so that's honestly the that's where pharmacists come into play. And so UNC is very uh, nice to have what they call clinical pharmacists here on every single service of the UNC Medical Center here. Every single service has a, one pharmacist, which is just unbelievable because it's a... That's not common. It's not, it's not... To have them there is common, but to have them at such a high level is uncommon. Uh, so UNC, uh, they the hospital system, of course, is always there to try to save money. Uh, and then, I mean, that should be secondary to helping patients. But yes, <laughs> helping patients, of course, and then saving. Still somewhat uh, profit driven. Or, we still yeah. got to make a profit. You still need to look at where you can save money. Unfortunately, that's the way we've set things up. <laughs> and so one of the things that needs to occur in any hospital system is always to think about what is a place where we can save money. And it's always uh, readmissions is a big one. Uh, of course, because if you get readmitted after, say, within 30 days, then you get dinged from Centers of Medicare and Medicaid Services, and you won't get reimbursed as a hospital for the second time around. Oh, I didn't realize that. That's big. Yeah. And so they want to do anything they can to do that. And so the we always hear about antimicrobial resistance, mm -hmm. uh, antibiotic resistance. And so this is key for the judicious use of antibiotics, at least is what I had done, but then also for anyone else, any of the other pharmacists to be able to look at the judicious use of other drugs in general to help save the hospital money and all that kind of stuff. And if you can do that, then your ROI on a pharmacist, your return on investment is huge. Right. You just pay someone, you know, however much you pay them, and then you as a health system save potentially like hundreds of thousands of dollars like that's that's just like a no-brainer mm -hmm. and so uh we're unique here and so to do that obviously requires a farm d and so when i came in it was kind of natural for me to just kind of go back into the swing of things that i had done that's really neat so not many of your classmates have done this sort of Unique advantage from having done the PharmD in the first place. Classmates in PhD. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So three of us, the in my incoming class, we had three of us who had a PharmD. Oh, okay. So that's fairly common then. To, that's to do the double degree. Well, yeah. <laughs> it's actually it's interesting you mention that because it's uh it's not as common to have a PharmD and a PhD. Mm -hmm. Now it's probably more common here because we're at an academic institution. True. So, but I think overall the percentages will say that it's really, really, really rare. Okay. Okay. Just, Just a, a lot, lot of career students here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not a bad life I will say yeah um, that's awesome I, I didn't realize that whole system was in place and, and I know there's been a lot about antibiotic resistance mm -hmm. um, so it's really comforting I guess to hear that people are actively thinking about that in the hospitals you always hear these doom and gloom stories about how oh, yeah. we're creating these super bugs and uh, right. whatnot but it does seem like we have the best minds in place to at least slow down the production of these, these super bugs yeah it might be an inevitability but right exactly and like no we totally get it like there's a you know we hear of mrsa i'm sure you've heard of that or MRSA, yeah. as, as it's called uh you know we use methicillin or the equivalent to methicillin here in the united states methicillin was used in europe for a long time uh so i won't go into the history of antibiotics even though it's a super awesome history <laughs> Maybe uh, for another episode. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe another time. But the uh, we use methicillin because we couldn't take care of skin infections until penicillin came around. But now the problem was, what about staph? And so staph was one that we needed drugs for. And so methicillin was one of the very first ones to be able to actually take care of staphylococcal uh, infections, which are usually on the skin. Like uh, a flesh-eating bacteria. Right. And so, like, for you and me, we have staph on our skin. If you were to culture our skin, it would say staph, not a problem. Mm -hmm. Staph gets into the blood, now we have a problem. Uh, but if it's on our skin, not a big deal. Uh, but after a while, we use methicillin, great, everyone's happy, and then we use it, use it, use it, use it. After a little bit of time, like after a couple of years, then we started to see, now we have methicillin-resistant staph aureus, mm -hmm. which is a big one. And so now we have a problem at that point. And so then now we create drugs to try to combat that, and then bacteria become resistant to that and the only way to the only way to stave this off that we know of so far other than i don't know maybe uh, i mean there's only really one way which is you have to self-police mm -hmm. you have to self-police the use of antibiotics so maybe if there was a case back then where you said only use methicillin for x purpose not for everyone but just for some people for this indication based on our hospital policy you get a ton of people looking into that 
then maybe we could have used methicillin, for instance, a little bit longer. And so MRSA may not have shown up in the seven, early, late 60s, early 70s, but maybe in the 70s, 80s. Who knows? Uh, but now we know better. Mm-hmm. And so now we know that we have to be much more judicious and prudent with how we use antibiotics. And so the government has seen that. Federal government has seen that. Senator Medicaid, Medicare services have seen that. And they even require someone such as a pharmacist to be able to do that. And so that's why we have a ton of pharmacists here who do a lot of that work uh, and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So one thing, one problem I'm envisioning is that we might do this at UNC, but another hospital, for example, Duke, although I doubt they're not doing that over there. (laughs) I think they have their their ship pretty um, well and tight. But if another hospital isn't doing the uh, implementing these policies, then if you have to admit a patient who is recently been there, then they might just bring in this resistance strain. So um, are hospitals like countrywide, worldwide adopting these things, or is it slow to be implemented? It's quick, because now there's, at least in this country, now there's an in- a financial incentive if you do that. Mm, and that's it, as always w- what makes it work. Yeah. As, well, as well as a financial penalty if you don't. Okay. And so it's, uh, and again, the ROI is just, yeah. it's just huge. I mean, only from a public health standpoint has been recommended by the CDC and everything like that. But now CMS says like, you know, if you're not familiar with the funding scheme of CMS, CMS pays not only individual providers, like, you know, your own physician, but then also pays for a health system for kind of just like a, uh, a lump sum of money. And we'll take into account a whole host of things, which is of course going to be antibiotic resistance. And of course, readmissions and all that stuff that I mentioned. So CMS says, I want you to have someone who's doing this. Here's money to do it via grant from a couple years ago. Uh, former President Obama had talked about antibiotic resistance and how it's important to have a what they call an antibiotic stewardship program. And stewardship is literally just that, a steward of antibiotics to stave off resistance as much as you can to at least buy us some time until we can develop new drugs. Mm-hmm. And so that's a, it's huge. Uh, that's a big one. Wow. Yeah. So there's a there's a lot happening behind the scenes. Right. Is, is the ultimate um, end game of this, which is very reassuring because again, I've been reading all these articles and now I'm starting to get paranoid. One question I've been meaning to ask you is, and you may not um, know a, a ton on the literature, but I imagine you know more than I. What are some of the ways in which uh, people can boost the immune system's productivity uh, or efficacy? I guess you would say. What are some of the ways in which you can strengthen the immune system, especially maybe throughout aging, where it's known to weaken? Yeah, it's a good question. And it's, it's hard to answer. So there's, there's a couple drugs that I can think of that help boost the immune system from the standpoint of just boosting it rather mm-hmm. than stopping the decrease of it. Okay, so like, for right. instance, HIV, we talked about the immune system, antiretrovirals for HIV will not necessarily boost it, or will boost it, but it will boost it from a like a negative value. You know what I mean? So it's going from worse to what it quote unquote should be. A rescue, yeah. Versus from like what it should be to work, to better. So it's not really anything like that per se, but like for instance, people who have a bone marrow transplant, they are, their immune systems get 100%-ish wiped out. And so they get massive doses of chemotherapy to wipe them out and then, then they get infused with the bone marrow from the donor. Mm-hmm. And so when where they, the immune system comes from, right? It's exactly. Like nest of the immune system. Or exactly. Like so that's like where exactly where the immune system comes from. So if you if your immune system is completely wiped out, you then get this bone marrow transfusion from the donor. Mm-hmm. And so now you have that individual's bone marrow in your body and you have technically speaking their immune system. Mm-hmm. Now it's just a question of like how's your body gonna do it? Like is your body going to sort of accept it, number one. And two is, once it does accept it, will you then now have the immune system at the level that it should be at like a quote unquote normal person? So they look at a whole host of different laboratory markers, which I won't get into, but one of the big ones is an absolute neutrophil count. And so they'll look at, does it recover? You're going to be sitting at zero, maybe 0.1 for a long, long time or for quite a bit of time after you get your bone marrow transplant Mm. because you just had wicked amount of chemo. That's true. And you got to wait for the other person's immune system to kick in. Mm -hmm. And so when it does, then you start seeing that number go up to like 0.5, which is great, or even one, two, all that stuff. And these are in units that like times 10 to the, you know, all that stuff. Uh, And that's called, that's a process called engraftment, which means that success, the immune system is back. 
But to kind of help aid that, you can give something called a uh, fogastrum, which is a drug that will essentially sort of exogenous T cells, mm-hmm. I guess, uh, or at least things to help help the immune system get to that point of engraftment to get to that quote unquote normal immune system. So we do have that. Uh, has that been used in HIV? I believe it has been, but from an experimental standpoint, it hasn't okay. been used routinely. And I remember seeing, I remember seeing some literature on that. I just haven't read it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it is interesting to note that that's an option that, mm-hmm. uh, has been looked at at least. Is it perhaps in clinical trials or? Has I honestly don't know. Yet? Okay. That's fine. Yeah. I, I can't keep track of any, <laughs> all the, uh, Alzheimer's drugs in clinical trials. People always ask me, I'm like, uh, I wish I could memorize all. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Very interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, this is, Got me thinking of all the um, aging, age-related uh, changes in the immune system. So I know in the news there's been like, uh, a lot of talk about how some CEOs are taking like young blood, and uh, they think part of the mechanism of that uh, being a cure for aging in some sense, or at least a theory of that it wards off aging, is that it's boosting the immune system. Right. Uh, I don't know. Maybe there's something to that. We'll, only time will tell for some of these people. <laughs> But a lot of them aren't even talking openly about how they're doing it. So I'm not sure we'll get a whole lot of data from that. <laughs> um, that's all the questions I have. Uh, anything you want people to take home about HIV therapy and uh, or even an experiment, an experience as a PharmD student, PhD student, or yeah. both of them? <laughs> <laughs> so I've learned that um, one of the things that I've learned is... Uh, this past year is that I'm much better at reading now. I know that sounds super silly. I, of course, could read before, but it was, uh, I'm able to read a lot more efficiently now. Mm -hmm. And I've gotten to the point where I think for, at least for some articles, I can skim the introduction. And that's when you know, (laughs) that's when you know you may understand it. (laughs) But if anyone has, you read the entire paper word for word. Right. Uh, as opposed to having to start and stop whenever I read the introduction and try to understand, oh, what does that mean? What does this mean? Mm. But reading, that's a good point. Yeah. reading is totally key. So, like, that's something that I learned even as a pharmacist is that you mm. just because you have to learn all this stuff, yeah. And it's a huge learning curve, but you have to read a ton of literature. And I just kind of took that into the PhD realm, sure. And it's obviously served me well because then I can talk about it. And then when I went on this clinical rotation, I went back to kind of what I was as a PharmD as well as a resident, which is uh, uh, having to learn something new again and then read the literature. And I realized that my ability to like uh, learn new information, to read the literature, explore literature, and then look up stuff has been just honed and you know sharpened very well throughout these years. And so you know it's very nice to be able to do that. And so also translated into, you know, lay reading as well. I can remember things better, <laughs> which is always nice. You know, that's a great skill to have. So I think uh, I think the two degrees, PharmD and PhD, overlap a lot in the sort of the reading sphere and I think uh, in the literature evaluation sphere. And I think that's always a big one that, you know, when people ask me, oh, my gosh, PharmD, then PhD, like what, up, what what's going on there? He's like, honestly, as long as you read, like it's it's doable it's manageable and that's always a big thing to, i always think the only way to get over not knowing something is to know it <laughs> and so that requires reading and so rmd took me there and so now phd will keep me there i guess mm-hmm. yeah i've already learned you've already learned how to learn yeah essentially exactly yeah reading is definitely a big skill and also just building off this library of vocabulary terms right for, for your field right that can be really <laughs> tough and i think it's really daunting to some people but it just takes time there's no there's no secret to it in my in my view it's just some a little bit of brute force but then you start to learn the nuances and what you can gloss over and what you really should read and highlight and, and whatnot right you i'm sure have a lot of papers um what do you use to like organize them in your mind or on your computer yeah like so definitely so my uh, definitely not in my mind <laughs> could never do that in my mind uh but i use a thing called f1000 i don't know if you've ever heard of it i have yeah it's it's glorious it's great I, by the way i have like absolutely no nothing to do with f1000 no kickbacks <laughs> no kickbacks or anything like that but it's free to use for anyone uh, we can we as unc students and i'm sure other institutions will be able to have like access to like a more advanced quote-unquote advanced version uh but here are you but just as a regular person you can just get f1000 workspace.com it allows you to do that there's four reasons why I really like it. One, it it manages all your references, which is nice. 
Two, it can manage them in a project by project standpoint. And so you'll be able to uh, organize them in however you want to do it. So if you, if for instance, you want to say Alzheimer's, a little too broad, but if you were to say like Alzheimer's clinical trials, then you could just import a ton of PDFs mm -hmm. through PubMed, through anything like that, and just throw them in there. And then three, through its internal algorithm, it will then spit out suggestions to you. So what I had used to do before, which took forever, which is I just go to PubMed and start doing all my search terms that I always knew about and then do that. Now I can still do that, but from a supplementary standpoint versus like a primary thing. Mm -hmm. And we'll spit out suggestions. You can get email reminders about it, like on a week basis or something like that, just to kind of check out, oh, like, oh, here's an article. Mm -hmm. And some of these articles come out like the day of. Okay. It's like EPUB ahead of print type of thing. And it's yeah. just like August 15th. It's like, well, that was very recent. That's pretty good. And the fourth thing is that it has plugins with Google Drive and has plugins with Microsoft, Microsoft Office sort of mm -hmm. things. So if you're writing a paper, you can have that as uh, you can literally import the citations from whatever project you're doing, write your write the sentence, refer to that paper, and it will create a bibliography. And one of the one of the things that we absolutely hate to do because it has to be done is if you say, oh, I need to move reference six up to reference four and three needs to go down to eight and four needs to go to seven or something. And you're mm -hmm. thinking, well, this is going to be a nightmare because yep. now I got to not only do I have to reorder those numbers, but then I have to reorder everything else in tandem, automatically do it. And then as that plug in, you will then uh, you can highlight a phrase. And then have the F1000 actually suggest a paper based on the phrase that you're saying. So if you were writing a review article and you want to be as comprehensive as you possibly, possibly can, within Word, you don't even have to go to the internet. You just Within Word, you can say, highlight, you know, Alzheimer's clinical trials. And you say, all right, I have this one, I have this one. Oh, what's this one about? It's suggested. Let me take a look into it right there in Word. And so it's a... Uh, it's great. It That's it helps. Cool. Yeah, I do happen to be writing a review article. Oh, there you go. Another <laughs> Alzheimer's clinical trials. And review articles are, as you know, notorious for just mountains of references, yep. as I'm sure you know. So yeah, like hundreds, maybe. Uh, yeah, I think I've already broken a hundred. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and so, like, if ninety nine goes to twenty six, like. Mm -hmm. Ouch. Yeah. Right. I use Mendeley. It seems very similar. Right. Although similar. that last function seems very appealing to me because um, the one area where Mendeley struggles is it has a word pl plugin too, but I have to really know exactly what paper I'm looking for when I add that in. Yeah. And so if I don't, I have to back out and then I have to go find it in like the general Mendeley browser, not the plugin. And yeah, that, that part is a headache for me. Yeah. So if it were to suggest a few papers, <laughs> that would. <laughs> and it's certainly not perfect. I mean, maybe yeah. it can only go with what you give it, mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, it's pretty good. I can keep up with a lot of stuff like fairly quickly, even in big journals. So it's not like, you know, you're getting it from even smaller journals, I mean, and it's just like you get it from, say, New England, of course, uh, or like JAMA or something like that, but you can get it from like smaller journals that, yeah, you know, may not be cited as much, but you can be the person that cites it. They might cite you back, and, you know, that's pretty cool. Yeah. And I started to notice that like some of the same people writes uh, are on the papers, like over and over again. I started out, it's just like, oh, I've seen this name about a hundred times. Because, yeah. <laughs> oh, they're writing something that, I'm using as references mm -hmm. and they've written about it for like 20 years and I'm just like oh I'm using their references like eight oh, times yeah. <laughs> yeah they're like science celebrities that you start to get to know like <laughs> yeah. whole science families sometimes like yeah. husband and wife teams are actually pretty common I've found yeah I've noticed pretty, that too <laughs> really neat so yeah it's been a fun ride for myself as well thank you Aaron for coming on no thank you again uh, for really having appreciate me appreciate it um, yeah, we'll have to do this again, uh, pending publication, maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, for sure, let's stay in touch. No, it's been fun. It's, uh, you know, I don't have a lot of experience with podcasts or anything like that, but it's, uh, I always find I always find this type of stuff fun. So it's, uh, yeah, I'd love to be back whenever you get a chance, and uh, sure. hopefully I can talk about something that, you know, maybe your listeners want to hear about. That yeah, I'm sure people will have questions. I'm big on history, too. So history okay. doesn't even have to be about science, even though it's called straight from scientists. But <laughs> that's just a person, right? Yeah. Or much more than that. Uh, <laughs> exactly. History, politics, well, maybe not politics, but history as well, if need be. Yeah, yeah. Uh, science policy counts, right? Yeah. <laughs> And I got to put a plug in for Science Policy Advocacy Group or SPAG. Mm. I happen to be treasurer of that, which is why I'm putting the plug in. But when you mentioned science policy, it reminded yeah. me to do that. Uh, you know, so we do a lot of, uh, we try to do a lot of outreach events and stuff like yeah. that. We like to do days on the hill. Uh, yeah. So we're very fortunate to be living near Raleigh, which mm. is, of course, capital of North Carolina. And 
uh, we're gonna try to do some visits with yeah. uh, people, maybe even you know try to get some candidates because it's obviously an election year. Mm-hmm. I kind of think about that, but you know events are pending. Uh, but okay. for those of you who are at UNC, like bolo for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've been to one of your events and uh, need to check the calendar again. I guess <laughs> <laughs> um, those, those things seem really appealing to me. I don't know if that would eventually lead to lead to a career path or anything, but it's something I certainly need to learn more about because it's very nebulous to me and how yeah. the actual policy. Um, promotion or, or actually advising works. And one of the things we were talking about is podcasts. And I told our the president of our organization, I said, you know, speaking of podcasts, I know of someone, and of course I, I named you as well. So I might put you in contact with That'd them just great. in case. Yeah, I, one of our favorite episodes was um, uh, Dr. Francis Cologne. Cologne, she, yeah, yeah, back exactly. in uh, March, I believe. Yep. And so I think people really took to that. And not only is she really eloquent, but um, she brought a lot of good points and like, Give us some really good advice on how to actually pressure senators, congressmen, yeah. and where to start. So, yeah, for sure, we'll we'll be in contact about that. I can probably give you a card, but yeah, yeah, no, no, for sure, I'll do that. <laughs> well, anyway, thank you again for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank, it thank you so much for coming on, Aaron. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks for listening, all. <laughs>